Good morning, and thank you for joining us at the Ottawa Business uh, Small Business Summit. Uh, my name is Michael Curran from the Ottawa Business Journal, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Small Business uh, Week event. Uh, I'm joined uh, this morning by several people who will be introduced over the next few minutes. Uh, but first off, I want to introduce Su Ling Ching, the President and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Good morning, Su Ling. Good morning, Michael. What a, uh, what a great time to be talking and an important time of, uh, to be talking about small businesses. Absolutely. And so I want to take a moment and welcome everyone to our 2020 edition of the Small Business Summit. An unusual year, but an opportunity for us to continue to learn and be connected to each other. So we're happy to be hosting this virtual event during this week where there's a focus on small business the importance of small business and something that has really come to light even more so over the last uh, few months. Why small business is so important to our community, their economic impact, the culture they bring to our community. So we have had a very challenging time as small business owners, some, some would say like never before. And uh, we're pleased to bring this conference here to help these entrepreneurs to grow even more resilient and successful businesses. Very well said, and uh, I, I appreciate, and I'm sure many other people appreciate that the Board of Trade has been on the front lines speaking to our public officials and our public health officials as, as well as we get through this pandemic. Um, uh, OBJN, the Board of Trade, have been hard at work at this event for several weeks. In fact, there was a committee struck uh, in the Board of Trade to select some of the specific topics to make sure they were relevant to small businesses. We have five sessions planned for you today. We're gonna to kick off just in, in a few seconds. I'm super excited uh, to have Spencer Sheenan, who's uh, actually, will be introduced in a second. Spencer will come right to you. He's joining us from Vancouver. So he's very kindly up at six o'clock in the morning uh, to do that. And he is giving a session called, I can't say the first word, it's unblank your books. And uh, we'll explain what that means in a few seconds. In session two, we'll hear from the chief economist of the BDC and also the vice uh, president of research. Uh, of course, Small Business Week is a BDC initiative. And uh, Pierre uh, Clarou is the gentleman's name, and he does a marvelous, marvelous job at, uh, at kind of what you do, Spencer, making numbers speak and focusing on the important number. Uh, so, Ling, do you want to tell us about session uh, three? Absolutely. So in session three, we'll have a group discussion about what it means to be an entrepreneur in a pandemic. Our own Mark Sutcliffe will host the session along with our conference co-chairs, Carla Briones and Lee Underwood. In session four, we will turn to Vicki Iverson and Matt Strentsy, Strentsy, sorry. It's of, a tough one. <laughs> of uh, Iversoft to talk about digital transformation and that has been of course, a big topic as we have gone through this pandemic and we're all working from home and marketing our businesses online. In session five, to wrap up the day, we're really excited to focus on mental health during the pandemic with an expert from the Royal Ottawa. And I did have a chance to meet with Emily Deacon and it's going to be a great session. And again, mental health and mental wellness is a huge topic right now. So, you know, we have uh, finance, we've got uh, the economy, we've got mental health, uh, we have uh, kind of c connecting as entrepreneurs, and we have digital transformation. So I think we've got a really jam-packed session. Of course, we're going from nine until one today. Um, events like this couldn't be possible uh, without the uh, support of uh, sponsors. And we've got a stellar lineup of sponsors. Listen to this list. We have TD Bank in our uh, lead position, Lynn, I'll introduce you in just a second here. We have BDC, who's a partner in this event, of course, the organizer, Small Business Week. RBC, we have Tech Canada, uh, and our global event partner for 2020, Oakwood uh, Designers and Builders. And it's at this point where I'd like to turn things over to a representative, uh, someone who's very active with the Board of Trade, I should point out, Lynn Johnson. Uh, from TD. Thank you, Lynn, for all the support you're providing us uh, in, uh, in this event. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, indeed. I'm never a person without words. Good morning, <laughs> all. So my name is Lynn Johnston. Yes, I, I'm the banker, not the uh, comic strip writer from uh, The Better or Worse. 
And on behalf of TD Canada Trust, we're very excited to be back here in our second year supporting the Small Business Summit. While this year's event looks a little bit different than it did last year, where we all gathered at the Western Touchy Feely, um, TD does continue to be a raving fan of the Ottawa Board of Trade and its advocacy in support of small business. So, a little bit more on the emotional side of things. Managing a 300 plus portfolio of small business clients over the past seven months has been probably the most challenging of my 35 years in business banking and working with, with you as small business owners. I've experienced a full range of emotions as you have shared your frustrations, your worries, your tears, and right along with me all through those early months of the pandemic. And then, well, what happened? We began to celebrate those little things. Uh, we could celebrate as you began to do that pandemic pivot. You're figuring out a way how to make money, generate revenues, keeping government restrictions and the safety of your clients top of mind. Wow. I am so, so proud of all of you. Yes, many of you may be working in your business today instead of working on your business, but this too will change as we grow stronger together. So with a fantastic lineup of keynote speakers today, I know you are going to walk away feeling motivated, inspired, and encouraged. And I'm going to close by sharing my pandemic memo with you. Tough times never last, tough people do. Thank you, have a great day. Wow, Lynn, that was fantastic, very heartfelt. And uh, thank you to all the people at TD who I know are working hard to support our small businesses. Um, you mentioned working on your business, and that's the perfect segue to talk to Michelle. Um, Michelle represents today a group called Tech Canada. And uh, Tech Canada focuses on a few things. I'm just going to run through a couple of them, then we'll chat with Michelle, and then Michelle will introduce Spencer, by the way. So uh, Tech focuses on confidential peer groups led by a professional chair. And in fact, that's Michelle's job with, uh, with Tech Canada. She is a local chair of a tech group. Uh, of about uh, 14, 15, 16 people. Tech focuses on executive coaching and it focuses on event speakers uh, who provide thought leadership to tech members and that's Spencer. So we have everything coming together right now. <laughs> uh, if I sound enthusiastic about tech, it's because I'm a member and have been a member for almost two years and uh, even maybe a little bit more of a coincidence, although a planned coincidence, Michelle is my uh, tech chair and my executive coach. So, Michelle, thanks uh, Thanks for being with us. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, tell me a little bit about tech. Well, um, tech is really, as you said, Michael, about helping business owners work on their business and frankly themselves, right? Like the business owners are the most critical part of a business. They are the leaders, they are the inspiration, they are the visionaries. And so our job at Tech Canada is to support the business owners and entrepreneurs in showing up in the best way they can, at the same time as making sure their own needs are being met. And we do that through a combination, as you said, of coaching, peer coaching, and thought leaders coming to talk to our groups. Yeah. I, I can attest again that it's a very, very powerful program. And again, Lynn, just a minute, minute ago, talked about working on your business. That's part of it. And as Michelle said, it's working on you as a leader equally. So what we're going to experience now, Michelle will introduce Spencer. And what we're going to experience is the caliber of people um, that tech regularly brings to meetings. So with that, Michelle, maybe you can introduce uh, Spencer. Great. Thanks, Michael. Good morning, everyone. So as a CPA and former CFO, I know how challenging yet critical it is to stay on top of your finances, especially during difficult time, economic times, which we are in. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our first speaker this morning. Spencer Scheinan has over 15 years as an entrepreneur, combined with extensive experience as a fellow CPA and investment banker. He is the founder and CEO of Shift Financial Insights, where they provide ridiculously simple accounting and financial insights for businesses on the rise. I just have to stop for a second and say, I love that. Doesn't everybody want their finances to be ridiculously simple? I love it. 
Spencer has also been a business owner in the areas of manufacturing, construction, real estate, and cold storage. That's quite a gamut. On top of that, he is also an instructor for the British Columbia Charter Professional Accountants Association and is a guest lecturer at the University of British Columbia. So if all that isn't enough, he's also passionate about air, uh, marathon sports, endurance sports. He's done many marathons, ultra marathons, Ironmans, distance cycling events, and marathon distance swimming event. Now, as a mom of a former competitive swimmer, I actually was curious how long that was. And so I looked it up. And for those of you who are interested, it's 10 kilometers. So maybe Spencer will tell me later what, uh, how long that actually took him to do. Sounds like an awful lot of swimming to me. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Spencer. Right on. Thank you for that very kind intro, Michelle. I'll just answer your question. Uh, it was an open water swim and uh, was a, took me about three hours and 45 minutes. So um, with the waves and the chop and not going straight, it took a little bit longer. Okay, awesome. All right, well, uh, let me do a share screen here and I'm just gonna change one or two of my settings which will um, help me do the best I can for you here. Uh, well, I'm really excited to be here this morning. Of course, I wish I was uh, live and with you actually in Ottawa. And of course, that's not possible right now. Um, but what, what I'd like to do is try and make things as close to being there as, as, as we can. And whether you're a, a, a small business that has really been impacted over the last seven months uh, by what's going on, or, or whether your business has really done well and has been a rocket ship, you know, there have been lots of businesses that have taken off during this period. It, it's a very common thing uh, that in struggling times, businesses do really well. And so whether you're a rocket ship or struggling right now, everything I'm going to talk about is going to be relevant for your future. And as Michelle said, you know, particularly if you're someone who struggled with numbers, who, you know, I have the benefit having been an entrepreneur for the last uh, 15 years. I'm also a CPA. And I understand what those numbers mean that are buried. You know, your financials are dying to tell you a story. And speaking of stories, I'd love to tell you a story about the Mars Orbiter. The Mars Orbiter was built in NASA in the late 1990s at a cost of about $125 million. And its mission was to be the first weather station on another planet. And what happened as it was approaching Mars in the red planet, it was supposed to go into our orbit around Mars. But what happened is that something went wrong. It slipped into the atmosphere and burned up on entry was a catastrophic failure. Now, I have a photo of the moment. And I, I just to warn you, it, it's, it's a bit of a, it, for some people, it might be hard to look at. It's, it's the moment the orbiter burned up on entry. And I know that looks like a horrific scene, but you know, there's a silver lining in, in, in every situation. There's, there's a Martian here who's actually jumped on the opportunity selling end of the world t-shirts. You know, there's an entrepreneur in every crowd, no matter what's going on. So like I said, there's some people who are really using COVID reinventing themselves and creating a rocket ship. Well, but more importantly, uh, what we can learn from this story is NASA, of course, did an investigation to figure out how did this happen? How did we have a catastrophic failure with a $125 million uh, Mars orbiter? And what they discovered is that the software that was powering the engines was measuring force in metric or newtons, whereas the software that was picking up the readings from the orbiter and relaying it back to mission control was measuring force in imperial or pounds. Now, for those of you who aren't up on your pounds to uh, Newton's conversion ratio, it's one to 4.55. So what was happening is one of the softwares was trying to giving the readings to send the numbers up and the other software was trying to pull the numbers down. 
they were fighting against each other, went into atmosphere and burned up on entry. So the question is, the way this relates to your business is how many of you have had a failure in your business because you weren't super clear on your numbers or you didn't understand what the numbers were saying and you were out exploring the universe in, in metric, but you were getting financial information that was being provided in Imperial. You may not fully understand it. And think about how much better would your business be today is if you understood not just what your numbers mean, but you understand the stories built inside your financials. You understand what every one of those numbers mean so you can make better decisions. You'd be like 20% better, 30% better, double. That's what we're here to talk about today. How do we actually get on the same page with our financial information? And let me be clear, this is not an accounting lesson. I am not here to teach you how to actually read your financials. My goal today is to empower you to direct your accounting, uh, whether it's a bookkeeper, an accounting team, whoever it is, to bring you information in a way that's quick, simple, and easy to understand so you can take action for your business. Now, if we were together, I'd ask for a volunteer for a 10-second exercise. But since we're not together, I'm going to ask you all to do this exercise. So just, you know, all you need is a, a pad and a pen, just something small, basic. And what I'm going to do in a second, I'm going to put up a financial statement, an income statement. And I'm going to just walk you through it. It's going to be small. You won't be able to see it up front. That's okay. I'm going to zoom in before we do the exercise. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to see what are the three areas, what three expenses were the worst uh, expenses compared to your budget. I want you to pretend this is your company. So this, of course, on an income statement are the different line items. We've got the actual results so far this year. We've got our budget results for the year. And this, of course, is the difference between budget and actual. And again, your job is in 10 seconds, I'm going to give you, come up with the three items that were worse, budget versus actual, and by how much were they worse. We're going to look only at the expenses. Zooming in, three, two, one, go. Well, there's actually some more data here I should probably let you see. And time. So how many of you got that? How many of you figured out the top three misses by how much uh, we missed in terms of worst budget versus actual in 10 seconds? Now, I've done this. I've actually visited several tech groups. I've, I've shared versions of this talk with them. And almost never does anybody get this answer. And it's really because I was being a bit of a jerk. I only gave you 10 seconds. I scrolled the data. There was lots of data there. But I want to do that exercise again. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. What three line items, what three expenses were you over budget by most? And I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do it with the exact same data. Three, two, one, go. And time. So how'd you do that time? Now, I usually get about 100% success rate when I do it that way. And I'm pretty sure you figured out that we've spent too much on wages by almost 200K. This is a huge number, uh, rent consulting, and there we go. That's the thing, that was exactly the same data. I gave you exactly the same amount of time. And I'm guessing about halfway through those 10 seconds, you're like, okay, well, let's move on, like I got it. We can create that much clarity out of our financial information when we present it right, and when we present the right information. The dilemma we have is a lot of us feel like we're in a, under a dark cloud because our financial information is confusing or we don't understand it. We don't know what it means. We don't know, it, it just, it blocks us from getting there. And also think about it, as you do grow, it, maybe you have aspirations to add uh, more team members, get bigger, maybe a new division, different type of product, different type of sale, whatever it is. The bigger you get, the more other users within your company are also going to feel like this. And so getting to clarity, getting to that financial freedom is going to allow you to actually make those decisions you need to make.
Now, there's a, the question is, why do we always, why do we have this problem? Why do we have so many entrepreneurs who are stuck under this dark cloud of financial information? Well, one of the reasons actually is related to building a house. So let's just have a quick look. Imagine you were building your dream home. And of course, uh, you would have somebody who's going to be your lead point of contact. That's going to be uh, your general contractor generally. And they're going to have sub trades underneath them. They're going to have, it could be uh, electricians and carpenters. And of course, you're going to want some plumbers on site as well. And then sort of at the bottom of the totem pole of uh, the, uh, the, the construction stack is, of course, also the laborer. That's the person that's there digging ditches, uh, hauling lumber, um, hauling bags of cement, etc. And all of those are really important people and you need them all in order to build a house. The same sort of stack exists on the accounting front. It's just in the accounting department, I should say, it's just we don't intuitively understand it the same way as we do the accounting uh, uh, construction stack. So at the bottom of the accounting stack is the transactional function. This is all the stuff that you kind of think of as accounting, the day-to-day -day stuff that you probably hate. It's your payables, receivables, invoicing, payroll, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, typically handled by bookkeepers and clerks. Above that is the, uh, the reporting and compliance function. The reporting function, of course, is going to be your monthly reports, your cash flow forecasts, your budgets. You all have cash flow forecasts and budgets, right? Right? Okay, good. But the part of this role that people often overlook is the compliance side. And yes, even as an accountant, I find the compliance side boring. Uh, this is where you're doing things like your policies and procedures, picking which accounting system it is, building the chart of accounts, uh, uh, creating the financial statement presentation, all of that type of thing typically handled by somebody called controller, assistant controller, maybe senior accountant on occasion. And this is where you'll start to see people with a CPA designation uh, show up. Not every controller needs to be a CPA by all means, but this is usually where you'll start to see the CPA designation. And then at the top of the stack is the strategic function. This is somebody who's a senior leader of your business. If, if, if you're a solopreneur, uh, you're not going to have this role, but if you're uh, if you have a team and you're building a team, this would be a senior person on the management team, typically called a CFO, a director of finance, something like that. And they're going to help you understand the long-term implications of your finance decisions. Maybe running a model, maybe if you're looking at changing your pricing strategy, what, how is that going to impact the business? Now, the reason this is a problem for emerging entrepreneurs and small business it's because of the, the, the Robert Half Salary Guide. Robert Half is uh, the country's largest recruiter of finance and accounting people, and they put out a salary guide every year. And since I have uh, uh, a business that outsources accounting, I'm always hiring accountants. So as an accounting nerd, I like to read this. And what, you will, what we can see is that the bookkeepers and clerk, the salary range is somewhere from the mid-30s up to well over 70K for a full cycle bookkeeper. The reporting and compliance, your controllers, assistant controllers are going to be from like almost 70K to like a couple hundred. And then on the strategic side, it almost doesn't matter. It's like over a hundred to, to literally going to the moon. And I should point out that this was actually um, price indexed to Ottawa. So Ottawa's cost of accounting is about 0.5% higher than the national average. So you're pretty well spot on the national average. And of course, the problem is, as a small business, there is no way we can afford to hire somebody at each level. So what almost always happens with small business, I've rarely seen this done otherwise, is we end up hiring a bookkeeper to run our entire accounting department. And that's pretty much like hiring a laborer to build you a house. They probably know some, uh, they'll know some, uh, um, uh, carpentry, they'll know some plumbing, they'll know some wiring, but you would never hire a laborer to build your entire house, yet we seem to think it's okay to hire a bookkeeper to run our entire accounting department. They're an absolutely important part of it, but they don't have the skills you need to do everything. So you're going to them expecting them to give you advice, you're going to them to expecting them to give you insight, 
but that's not their job. That again, that would be like going to a labor and say, yeah, go ahead and install all the plumbing in the house. They're not trained to do it. So that's how we get stuck. Now, one other thing about the accounting stack I just wanna share with you is something you can take with you going forward is I like to think of the bottom of the accounting stack as the accounting hygiene. These are the basics. This is what you just, you, you have to have in place. And, and you know, it, it, you have to have it in place for like a few key reasons. Uh, number one, of course, if you ever wanna borrow money or continuing borrowing money, your bank is gonna look through your accounting hygiene to see if it's right. If you ever sell your business, your buyers, bankers, and lawyers will absolutely dive into your accounting hygiene. Uh, if you ever get audited, say by the CRA, um, they will absolutely, your auditors will be digging into your accounting hygiene and they will be wearing rubber gloves while they do it. So your accounting hygiene has to be right. But imagine if somebody walks into your accounting hygiene and it looks like this. If you walked into this bathroom in a restaurant, you'd wonder what's going on in the kitchen. Same thing, when people look at, are looking at your accounting hygiene and it's not right, they're wondering what's going on in the rest of your business. But I don't think those are the reasons, the most important reasons why you have to have your hygiene right. It's because it informs the insights of your business. And the insights is what I was talking about before that uh, help you make those better decisions for your business. And the hygiene was never meant for you. It was never done in a way for entrepreneurs to understand. Again, I went to school for three years to learn how to write, create, and interpret financial statements. And you probably didn't. And there's a chance your bookkeeper didn't either. They might've done some schooling. But the insights is what's gonna allow you, it's quick, it's easy, it's intuitive, allow you to make better decisions for the, your business. So if there's one thing I really want you to take away from today is it's the difference between your hygiene, not for you. That's the accounting stuff for people like me and bankers and, account and, and accountants. The difference between hygiene, not for you, and insights for you. Insights is gonna be what brings you clarity. All right, so how are we gonna get to insights here? Number one, we're gonna look at the format of your data. How can we create data in a way that is simple and easy to understand? And then secondly, how do we know which data we should be looking at so that we can actually clear our mind of all of these complicated statements that we look at? All right, we'll start by looking at the format. And I want you to take a look at this list of items. Uh, this is the specifications of a product that were launched in October of 2000. We've got processor speed, onboard RAM, da da da. And I'm wondering if any of you know what that is. Again, I, I've done this exercise with a bunch of tech groups and rarely does anybody get it right. Well, what if I said, this is a thousand songs in your pocket? Probably all of you got the iPad, iPod, right? It's how we present the information goes from a bunch of stuff I don't understand. I'm not technical, I don't know what five gigs means but I know what a thousand songs in my pocket. It means it's small and it holds a lot of storage, right? Same thing when we're looking at our financial information. When I showed this financial statement in that first exercise, there's all of this data that again, it's hard to understand. So how do we turn our data from this into a thousand songs in your pocket? Well, here's a way. Uh, I want you all just to think for like a couple seconds, what is this slide trying to say to you? Now, by now you've probably all figured it out. It's somebody who's chasing money into an early grave, something like that. Now we picked that up. I gave you like literally two seconds to do that. Now, if you had to explain it to somebody, it's gonna look like this. There's a man in a suit. He appears to be frantically chasing money. You can tell he's frantic because blah, 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 right? Our brain sees images faster than we read numbers and letters. 90% of information that is transmitted in the brain is visual. And most importantly, not only do we see the image faster, but we process it multiple times faster as an image than we do words and numbers. So when we look at these pictures, we can understand the root 
underlying meaning of these pictures literally in a couple seconds, where explaining it would take a lot longer. Okay, so how does this apply to business? Let's, uh, let's think about the, what the worst trends have been over the last five or 10 years, the, the worst trends in the world. Well, if you ask me, I would say they are man buns, segues, and of course, Kardashians. I don't think they've contributed anything positive to society in the last five to 10 years. So within your business, we wanna figure out the worst root causes, that the, 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 the worst trends, pardon me, in your business over the last couple of years. So what do I mean by that? Imagine you were looking at your expenses last year, and the yellow line is this year. The green line is last year. The gray line is budget. You don't have to be an accountant and you don't have to spend more than a split second looking, knowing that in January, your expenses are higher this year than they were last year in budget. And that's a bad thing. You can also see over the last few months, the expense trend really seems to be going up. You get all that information in a second or two. Similarly, if we start to get a little more fancy with our info, uh, and we're not going to talk about selection yet, we're going to do that in a couple minutes. But if we start to get a little more fancy and we want to pull out some relationships or we want to understand what's going on in the business, and we take something like labor as a percentage of sales, again, and what, what percent of your every dollar are you spending on labor? So as that goes up, it probably means you're making less money. Again, you don't have to be an accountant. And this is not a fancy chart. There is nothing unique or exciting. This is a basic Excel chart that I haven't even spent too much time on the graphics. So it takes not a lot of effort to get really clear on what that info is. And of course, we don't only have uh, line charts. My favorite type of chart, of course, is a pie chart. The difference between pie I've eaten and pie I will eat. Um, and so, if you were, how would you use this? So for example, let's say you've actually got quite a few accounts receivable. Here's a relatively big accounts receivable aging report, a classic accounting uh, report showing how long it takes you to collect, <clears throat> excuse me, how long it takes you to collect your accounts receivable. Well, how about this? And I said, what, what percent of your receivables is current versus overdue? Now, whether you deal with receivables or not doesn't matter because you can see that about half of your accounts receivable is current, where if you got it in the old accounting format, you'd have to figure out where's your current line, what's the total, what's the total of the total, et cetera, et cetera. So a picture, you can pick that up two seconds, half of my receivables are current, half of my receivables are overdue, that's no good. All right, and my favorite type of chart, of course, is a bar chart. Uh, this is a chart of uh, how many calories per drink. So if your goal, uh, and I mean, it's like six o'clock in the morning out here, so I haven't started thinking about this, but if your goal was to drink as much as possible for as few calories, you can try and figure it out from this, or you can, in literally one second, recognize that champagne is what you need to be drinking. And I feel really bad showing this to the red wine drinker is yes, red wine is the highest of them all. Now, uh, for the record, this is just something I pulled off the internet. So don't start drinking champagne and call me if you put on a couple pounds. That's, uh, this is just an illustration of how easy and fast it is to read the data when it's done in the right format. Now, the question, of course, is how do I know what format to choose? So I want to show you this data here, which I showed you in the chart a minute ago, is exactly the same data as this. Now, I don't know about you, but my brain does not see this data well. I look at this chart and I get quite confused. Whereas some people prefer this format because that's how their brain works. For me, it's always in this format. One of the things, when we get to the selection of data and I show you some example of charts that you can ask for, excuse me, um, don't get hung up on the style of chart I'm showing you. Get hung up on if it's not simple, intuitive, and easy. I can look at this. Okay, yep, this year is better than last year, is better than budget in two seconds. 
uh, ask for it in a different format. Remember, this isn't a counting lesson. I'm not teaching you how to generate this stuff. I'm trying to empower you to get your bookkeeper or your accountant to give you information in a simple, intuitive way, rather than the way we always see it, which is just too complicated and it's hard to extract the data. Even as an accountant, I like looking at information in digital uh, data visualized form because the stories jump out. All right. Moving on to the selection of data. Uh, this to me is so critical and the purpose of selecting the right data and the whole purpose in my mind of why we look at the insights, why we look at the financial information is to shine a spotlight on the most important issues facing the business through a financial lens. And what do I mean by that? Well, my good friend Archimedes once said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. So we need to find the levers in the business so that when we're applying pressure to that particular spot in the business, we can move the business the most. Uh, if we don't understand the financial information, if we don't see the insights, if we don't see the stories, we start applying pressure to several places of the business and we don't actually move it. So how do we actually put leverage to the most important parts of the business? So if we look at an income statement, okay, and I don't care how big or small your business is, what industry you're in, I don't care about any of that. All businesses have these five common areas on the income statement. Of course, we have sales, <clears throat> unless you're in a pre-startup mode, minus your cost of goods. This is the one accounting term I can't really get away from. This is your direct cost to deliver your goods and services. So when I was in manufacturing, we're talking about the bottle, the cap, the label, we called it the goop inside the bottle, the box, um, uh, the shipping, everything, the direct cost to get that product on the shelf. If you're a services business, it's gonna be a labor. If you've got a landscaping business, it's gonna be how much you're paying your staff to be out on site, uh, doing the yard work, all of that type of thing. If you're buying plants and charging that to your clients, everything to do with delivering. Uh, so your sales minus your direct cost, your cost of goods is your gross profit. You may have heard that called gross contribution. Gross margin is your gross profit as a percent of sales. And then minus your expenses. This is different than your direct expenses. This is going to be your overhead, your phones, your insurance, those types of things. If you're renting an office, those are your ongoing expenses, including taxes. You might hear them called operating costs. Your gross profit minus your expenses equals your net profit. Okay, back to the levers. There's only three ways you can increase the profit of your business. There are only three ways you can increase the profit of your business. You can increase sales, and that's done either through increased price or increased throughput. You can decrease your cost of goods. So again, in my manufacturing business, we made skincare products. So if we were making a bottle of sunscreen, that would be reducing the cost of the ingredients, reducing the amount of time or labor we spend on it. Or you can reduce your expenses, cheaper rent, less expenses, less travel these days, that's decreasing expenses for a lot of companies. But those are the only three things you can do. And so one of the things that helps by understanding that is you don't have to spend so much time worrying about everything within the business, if you're trying to get more profit, it's one of these three things. Similarly, on the balance sheet, there's only so much you can do to increase the cash in your jeans, okay? The income statement's gonna increase your profit, which will ultimately lead to cash. The balance sheet is gonna be cash in or out. It's not profit. So you can turn your accounts receivable faster, collect faster. If somebody owes you money, it's either in their pocket or yours, you want it in yours. So collect your accounts receivable faster. If you have inventory, maybe you have a store, maybe you uh, have some inventory, like I said, as a landscaper, you might have some plants or whatever. Again, turn your inventory faster. Inventory sitting on the shelf is money out of your pockets. Inventory sold to customers is money in your pockets. The one nice thing about not doing this live is you guys can't see I have a huge bald spot back here. That's because I had a manufacturing business for 15 years and two warehouses full of inventory. Made my hair fall out, 
Uh, you can actually stretch your accounts payable is one way to increase your cash. So maybe not pay as fast as long as you're not harming your suppliers or getting in trouble for paying late. And the one which, uh, depending again on what business you're in, this in statement doesn't have an example, is capital equipment. Uh, this would be if you have like machinery or trucks or whatever, using your capital equipment more uh, effectively. So these are the seven levers of the business. And really, those are the only things you can do. So now what we want to do is shine a light on your financial information to see which of these levers do I need to pull? Which of these are holding me back from growing? Which of these are holding me back from being more profitable or having a cash problem? Okay. So imagine now we're looking at uh, your financial report and it's January and you're a digital agency. So let's pretend this is yours. We're going to start off by understanding a high level picture. So we're going to start with a cash flow forecast. Um, I get many of you may not have a cash flow forecast, but as you start to grow and as you start to demand this from your bookkeeper or accountant, this is the format you want. So I can see for the next four or five months what's going on with my cash flow, and I can see that we have a problem in May and June. We started really well with about 60K in the bank, and now we're down somewhere around minus 70, and the good news is, is we round, rebound. So I can see that we have a short-term cash problem coming our way uh, in the next few months. And then I also wanna have a look at my net income, and let's have a look at January, because that's where we are. I can see that this year, we a little bit above break even. I can see we're above our budget, and we were above last year. And let's have one more look at net income. This is on a year to date basis. So the last chart was each month individually. This is now aggregated over the year. And again, we can see that this year we're doing way better than last year and way better than budget. So from a cash and profit perspective, I know what's going on. I'm a little worried about my cash and I'm feeling good about my net income so far. So now let's switch to the levers. Sales. How are we feeling about our sales? Well, again, this year is better than last year is better than budget. Look, if you don't have a budget, A, your goal is to actually get there, but B, uh, last year's not a terrible proxy. So if you don't have budget currently, then just substitute with last year. And let's look at sales on a year-to-date basis. Again, I'm pretty happy. My sales are above last year and above budget. Okay, that lever is looking pretty good. Let's look at our cost of goods. Now, the best way to look at cost of goods is often through our gross margin. This is our, our, our gross profit divided by sale. And of course, what we want is a, as high a gross margin as possible. If you're unfamiliar with this, you have some work to do. This is one of the most important things for you to figure out in your business is your gross margin. And of course, you want it as high as possible. I want the most amount of money available uh, most amount of profit available after my direct cost. So here we can see that our margin is lower than last year and quite a bit lower than our target. Year to date, doesn't look any better. It actually looks worse. Okay, so now we know we've got a cost of goods problem. Our sales are okay, our costs are a problem. Operating expenses, remember this is your rent, your phones, etc. Well, we're a little bit of a budget and we're definitely above last year. Year to date, uh, it may look like it's hiding there, but it's actually, uh, it's right almost exactly on last year. Um, or sorry, right on budget, and then it's a hair above last year. So it's, it's probably okay. It's definitely not good, but it's not terrible because we're on budget and where we expect it to be. So that's it for the income statement levers. We've got a pretty clear picture. Sales is good. Cost of goods is bad. Operating expenses is okay. Let's move over to the balance sheet. So accounts receivable days, this is how many days it takes me to collect my receivables. Uh, you can see this year it has gone from 25 days to 50 days. That means it takes you twice as long to collect your receivables. That's money in somebody else's pocket. That's bad. All right, let's look at this chart, which we saw before. 50% of our receivables are current, 50% are overdue. Also not good. That's a lot of overdue money that, that's not in your pocket. And we'll have a quick peek at payables. Very similar. 
or sorry, not similar. We're actually mostly current. There's a few slightly older things. I probably feel okay about this. There's no red flag. Uh, there's some stuff that's quite old. I don't know if that's an argument I'm in, but for the most part, this looks pretty okay. So what do we do with that? Now, being an ad agency, we don't have inventory or capital equipment. So if we go, uh, and this document will be made available to you, and we review, how did we do on our levers? Our sales was pretty good. Our cost of goods was really bad. Our expenses was okay. Our accounts receivable was pretty bad. And our accounts payable was okay. And so from a shining a light, what we've done is we can see that these are the two levers that needs the most love. These ones are okay. And this one is really good. Now we've actually got a pretty clear picture of how our business levers are doing. We understand the actual results against the budget. If you have one, if you don't have one, get on it. If you do have it, then you can compare against prior year. We've done it using data visualization with that summary overview where you could see where the levers were relative to each other. And we did that in like five minutes. Can you imagine? Now, how are we doing for time here? Let's have a quick peek. Okay, I'm gonna jump through this one thing here just from a time, sorry about that, there we go. So when we look at our chart, we can see that it's just cost of goods and accounts receivable that are off. So now what do we do? We know we've got two problems. We're going to do a high level overview and then we're gonna zoom in. So let's start by reminding ourselves on our cost of goods, our margin for the year looked bad. So there's gonna be in this instance, for each lever, there's gonna be certain analysis you're going to need to do. Uh, that's gonna be, I'm gonna do two examples for you right now because otherwise it's gonna take too long. I'll leave you with some resources on how to figure out which analysis you need to do for which lever. But your margin is gonna, your cost of goods are gonna be three things. It's gonna be your labor as a percent of sales for virtually every person watching this webinar. Uh, your labor as a percent of sales is probably your biggest cost. So I can see that for the last few months, my labor is going the wrong way. I can see it's higher than last year. So this is a problem. We have a labor problem that we now need to solve. Materials is another example. So is another thing. So if you're a store, if, you're a, if you do any manufacturing and you have materials, like I did bottle cap label, chemicals, goop, um, we can see now, I can see between those two, late materials is actually a bigger problem than labor. And then some of you might have some other stuff in cost of goods. It's usually quite a bit smaller, so we don't worry about it. But we also want to make sure it's not a problem. I don't see anything. So now I know I've got a labor and materials problem. Okay. The other thing that's the, one of the most important things you can do is because of this guy, Vilfredo Pareto and Peas. What do these two have to do? Well, the Vilfredo Pareto was out in his garden in the 1800s and he noticed that it was only on a few of his pea plants was actually generating most of the peas. He could collected most of the peas off a few plants. And then he started noticing this pattern everywhere. A few people seem to make most of the money. A few sports teams seem to win most of the games. And he came up with what is called the Pareto principle. And, uh, let me show you how it works, often also called the 80-20 rule. So if we look at, if you were to rank order your customers by say revenue, you can see that 50% of the revenue, by the way, the way this uh, chart works over here on the left, that's percent of revenue. So you can see it flattens out at 100% and along the bottom is count of customers. So six or seven customers is 50% of the revenue. What is that? 16 customers is like 75% of the revenue. Here, the 80-20 rule is almost perfect there. And just for fun, about half of the clients do, what's that, 90% of the revenue? This is so typical. This is probably the most important thing you can look at in your business, especially from a leverage perspective, is rank ordering your clients by revenue or if you've got the ability by gross profit and seeing where you make your money because in almost every business, the majority of their clients aren't making them much money. And we end up spending all of our time, energy, and money servicing a few clients. And so if we look at how much are we making, the top few clients, look at that, 50, 70, 80K, 
if for the first few compared to a couple of grand for the small one. And I'll tell you, this report is like four pages and at the bottom, it's a few hundred dollars, okay? So when you're looking at your business, how do you break up your customers so you can see where are you making the money? This is something you absolutely need to demand from your, uh, from your bookkeepers. Are you gonna look at it by customer? Maybe by customer type. If you don't have key accounts like this and you've got a lot of small customers, maybe you a store. Are there customer types? Are there segments, store, location, et cetera, business unit? How can you break it up? However you think about your business intuitively is how you can break it up to look at a Pareto. And depending on how sophisticated your numbers are, you can look at it by revenue or by gross profit contribution. So that's a real quick one in terms of cost of goods, how we solve the cost of goods problem. Moving on to the accounts receivable uh, issue. Again, we're gonna, each of these levers, we're gonna look at the high level overview, then we're gonna zoom in on the ones that are a problem. So we know accounts receivable, we've already seen these charts. So how do we then zoom in? What if we look at each, cu each customer and how overdue they are. These were my customers when I had the manufacturing business. And when Loblaws is paying slow, I now know that this is cost me. This is my accounts receivable problem if we look at how many days it takes each key account to collect. Now, uh, depending on your business, you may not be able to do overdue by customer, maybe it's overdue by customer type, by business segment, by other, whatever it is. So again, the idea is for each of these problem areas, you're going to zoom in and ask for the detail on those. Now, uh, I'm going to move forward quickly here. Uh, sorry, I, I froze for a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, Real quick, so now once you've figured out how do we actually solve these problems, now that we've had the high level, we've zoomed in on the detail. Number one, assemble a SWAT team. It's you, it's your partner, it's your accountant, whoever's doing this, it's your mentor, it's your advisor, join tech, go to your tech chair, whatever it is. Number two, then we do the deep dive. Then we can start to tear apart what's going on with the individual things. We identify is this a systemic problem or an acute problem, and then, attack it with our top three strategies. That's how we're gonna get to clarity. Now I went through a lot of data uh, during this, uh, I went through a lot of data here uh, and there's more levers and you could see we couldn't get into all of them in 45 minutes. Um, at the risk of seeming like a shameless plug, it's not. Um, I wrote a book, Entrepreneur Numbers. It was a bestseller this year, which goes through all of these levers and all of the different types of analysis. You don't even have to buy it. Go to entrepreneurnumbers.com. There's a bunch of free downloads that you can use that's gonna help you. There's sample packages, there's sample reports that you can use to drive your business. So uh, really quick, the key takeaways from this that I hope you got, number one, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, we're gonna understand it faster and easier. Number two, shine the light on the key levers of the business that are a problem. Focus only on the big issues. Get rid of the small issues so you don't have to worry about that brainstorm your solutions, and that's how you're gonna get to financial clarity. Thank you very much. There's my contact information, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this quick session on finance. Maybe I'll turn it back to Michael. Hey, Spencer, that <clears throat> was great, and I know we put you under the pressure there on timing. <laughs> Uh, but you yeah, I, I'm sorry. I felt I had to rush a bit. My yeah. apologies. No, no, it's not. It, it worked out great. And uh, we posted the link. Uh, importantly, entrepreneur, entrepreneurnumbers.com in the chat function. So if, if someone wants to check that out and get a bit more information, I think, Suling, you're going to wrap up for us. Sure. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Spencer. I have three pages of notes here, and I wish we could spend much more time with you. What a fantastic way to present what could be a dry and <laughs> um, topic, and you've done it in such a, an amazing way to make it simple. And I loved uh, so many things that you said about how our financials tell a story and, and to make small business owners realize, you know, there's a reason why they maybe struggle because the cost of accounting is high, 
but I think you've just basically given us our highest level insights in, in just 45 minutes. So, uh, and, and it's about directing the bookkeeper because the bookkeeper doesn't know. So, you know, get some of these downloads, use them as examples to get me this. So right. you don't have to be the accountant. And many of these things I think you shared with us could be easily automated. Right. And so uh, anyway, we, we hope to see you. Yeah. Uh, we hope to see you again. And we really appreciate your getting up early in the morning to be with <laughs> us at a reasonable time. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you shared your information because I'm sure there are many here who will want to follow up with you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Very Thank you very much. You. Have a great you, uh, rest of your session, everyone. So uh, I just want to say thank you again to our lead sponsor and uh, our banker with heart at uh, Lynn Johnson at TD Bank. And of course, also to Tech Canada for connecting us with Spencer and sponsoring this session. Uh, I also want to recognize our other sponsors, Deloitte, RBC, um, and of course, our um, Oakwood designers and builders. And we have a great session coming up now. Don't miss this. If you haven't seen Pierre Clarus speak before, he has spoken, I think, at, at Small Business Week for several years in a row now. And it's always an interesting perspective. Um, and BDC is a great supporter of the Ottawa business community. And of course, the, um, the creators of Small Business Week uh, which we've also declared in Ottawa as Small Business Week. So uh, you would have received your link for the next session. We hope we look forward to seeing you there. And uh, thanks again to everyone. Michelle, thank you. Spencer, Lynn, thank you.